Welcome to Murder in the Air Mystery Theater. I'm your host, Lori Fagan. In this podcast series, I'll interview authors who will then read their mystery, suspense, or thriller short stories or a chapter from their published books. In addition, sprinkled throughout the coming weeks, the podcast will feature radio theater style sections from the audiobooks for my three crime fiction novels. There will be prizes too, so stick around to the end to find out how to enter. On today's episode, we'll hear the written words of author Cheryl Cocroft of Cave Creek, Arizona, and I will read from her contemporary fiction novel, Spokane Words. Welcome to the show, Cheryl. Hi. Hi, Laurie. Cheryl, your novels are not really considered mystery, but there are a number of mysterious things that take place in them. Uh, the novels include Weeping Creek and Twice Dead, are more character-driven contemporary fiction in your series called Twisted Tales from Luna's Attic. And you can follow her edgy characters from the Northwest down to the Southwest United States as they experience odd encounters and strange situations. So, Cheryl, what is your writing process like? What's the best time uh, for you to write? I write any time of night or day. I don't really have a set routine. Um I'm a night owl, so I'm often writing or reviewing whatever I've written late into the night. And I think my only preference is no interruptions because I like to get fully absorbed in the story and visualise what I'm actually writing. Sure. As far as the process goes, um, I always write at home and use the keyboard at my desk. Um, I'm... I know many writers enjoy sitting in coffee shops, but I think there's too many distractions for me. And I think I would describe my writing style as organic. I don't use notebooks or story plans. My stories just evolve as I type. And I often don't know where the narrative will lead me. I usually start by visualising my characters in a scene and then I describe everything that I see in my mind's eye. And I find that visualising the action helps me with continuity. Also, I think getting to know your characters and how they will react in certain situations, they all react differently given, um, you know, a different set of circumstances. And I just like to become fully absorbed in the character's mindset and imagine how they would react. Most of my inspiration, I think, comes from my own life experiences and my interpretation of the world. And I often start with um, a conversation between two characters and then I add the context later. I often write scenes in isolation and then consider how best to arrange them into a story. And I'm constantly cutting and pasting paragraphs, um, substituting words, moving chapters back and forth um, until I feel the story flows. There's plenty of advice out there on story structure But um, I find some of this quite daunting and prefer just to rely on my own creative instincts. There's no right or wrong way to go about the process. You you just need to discover a process that works for you. Absolutely. And it sounds like it has. So you don't write really linearly. You write and then move things around. Is that basically it? That's correct. Yes. It's like... um, I create a collage and then make sense of it by weaving it all together. That's a nice way to put it, a collage. Yes. And part of the not planning and not necessarily knowing where you're going, I think for a writer, is half of the fun, right? Because then it keeps you interested and and wondering, oh, where are we going to go with this? Exactly, exactly. Sometimes it gets quite exciting. You think, oh, what's going to happen next? When I've spoken to people about this, they um, find it quite an unusual approach. But, well, how can you sit and write if you don't know what you're writing about? But 
I don't know, the, the characters, the situations, they fire up your, your imagination. And to me, it just makes it feel very fresh. And I would say that you, your imagination may be a little different from other people's. And that's why you're able to do it, because I think you have a very broad, wide imagination, which allows for your process. What is the most surprising thing that you would say that you've discovered about writing? How, how, how long have you been writing now? A few years? Yes, probably for about eight years now. And I think the most surprising thing to me is that I can actually write. Um, when I was in school, English literature was my least favourite subject. Um, I found reading the prescribed books an agonising experience. Um, I also managed to misinterpret most of the poetry and felt that if I was being told what to think, it was kind of missing the point. Shakespeare was also a struggle. I, I completely missed the story because I was too busy trying to translate each sentence into plain English. I mean, I, I would just be dying to leave the class and move on to something interesting like science. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, though, yes, because you've got to interpret and understand the, what the story is first before you can figure out what what is going on. And uh, trust me, yes. I mean, there's a lot of issues with, uh, with some of Shakespeare's works, too. It's come as quite a surprise to me that I've um, developed this uh, love for writing novels. So what are you working on next? Well, I'm... Partway through my Twisted Tales from Luna's Attic series, so far I've published three books and I'm currently working on books four and five. Um, once they're completed, I think I'll give this series a rest for a while, but I may resurrect it in the future because I, I quite like my characters and feel I've become quite involved in their daily lives. I've got plans for two more novels. And I think what I may do is cross-reference some of the characters from Twisted Tales. Um, some of the minor characters may become primary characters in my new novels. And I may refer to some of the characters in Twisted Tales and use them in minor roles in my new stories. Great. Because when you get to know these characters and you like them, you, you don't like to see them go away either. And readers don't either. Readers like to, you know, to find out more. And that's a great way to bring some of those minor characters and give them more of a, a meaty story, right? Yes, that's right. So you're working on two books at the same time? Because I, I'm kind of looking at the end of the series, I've got a certain amount of... Um, material I want to put into the next two books and so because of the way I write my organic way of writing I may have written the end of book five but I'm still padding out material in book four and pacing things out possibly introducing a new character which I may need to weave into the story I really don't think I could take this approach unless it was for Microsoft Word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, can't, I, I can't see how someone writing in a notepad would get on very well with my method of writing. <laughs> right, probably not. But that way, if you write something for four, number four, but then you realize, oh, I need something like that in number five, then you just move it back and forth then. And I can see how having those two at the same time would certainly fit yes. what you're doing. Yes. And, and if I discover a hole in my plot, like, oh, maybe I should have introduced this earlier, you know, if I'm working on book five, I can just go back and insert something into book five as a brief introduction. Right. And so it uh, just just helps the, like, fluidity of the story. Sure, sure. No, and that makes perfect sense to me. And I'm an outliner, so... That, uh, that uh, like I say, as there is no set rule, like you said, whatever works for you uh, is what what uh, what you need to do, right? Exactly. 
So, Cheryl, give us a bit of a setup for your selection, and then I will read a segment from Cheryl Cocroft's contemporary fiction novel called Spokane Words. Spoken Words is the first book in my Twisted Tales from Luna's Attic series. The main character in this novel is a young woman named Rachel Carter. She's an only child and lives with her reticent parents in Santa Monica, California. And she leads a rather uninspiring life and has been dating Rick for a few years uh, purely to relieve the tedium. But she realises things have turned serious when her mother starts discussing wedding arrangements with the future in-laws. So Rachel recruits her best friend Sophie to come up with a foolproof plot to thwart her mother's plans. Meanwhile, Rachel has also been connecting with people online through a website called The Last Chance Saloon, a place that's advertised as a refuge for the lost and lonely. It's um, a virtual bar where the bartenders pour virtual drinks and members are encouraged to pour their hearts out. All the members are anonymous and no real names are allowed. Rachel herself, she masquerades as lost soul. And while she's on the site, she becomes increasingly enchanted by the haunted man who relates desperate stories about his unpleasant childhood. She's also um, a newly recruited uh, accountant and attends a work conference in Las Vegas. And while she's alone in her room, she reads the Lonely Hearts ads and she's shocked to see a haunted man seeking a lost soul. She's intrigued by this coincidence and after some hesitation, decides to respond. She's even more surprised a few weeks later when he invites her to a show in Vegas. And after some mental wrangling, she takes a gamble and sets off for Las Vegas. And this chapter that Laurie is about to read describes Rachel's journey into the unknown. Spoken Words, Chapter 10, Haunted Man Rachel My weekend bags packed and stowed in my car, ready and waiting for my big adventure into the unknown. Anticipating the journey produces a slow radiating heat in the vicinity of my stomach. I'm not sure if it's fear or excitement. This is probably the craziest thing I've ever embarked upon, apart from seducing Rick's dad. I've wrestled with myself for days now, lurching in one direction, then another. Some days I'm inspired and full of optimism. Other days I frighten myself half to death by conjuring up grim situations with grisly conclusions. Today I'm reasonably calm, determined to go ahead with this challenge rather than endure weeks of regret and another weekend watching TV, in bed, alone. Luna's forecast was most encouraging. You are about to embark on a physical and emotional journey. Neptune urges you to follow your heart and enact your dreams. Pluto's energy sustains your transformation. Your only reservation should be your ticket out of here. But that's the trouble with horoscopes. You can always twist the words to fit your circumstances. I've made arrangements with Mrs. Tracy to feed Butch while I'm away. I'm meeting an old friend, I told her. It's not quite a lie. He might be old and friendly. Who knows? I also said I'd be back late Sunday afternoon. But if I don't make it, at least I'll die knowing Butch will be cared for for the rest of his days. Luckily, Sophie's spending the weekend in Carmel with her future in-laws, so there'll be no missed calls from her wanting to know where I am and why I haven't answered. She hasn't asked what I'm doing this weekend, so I'm not exactly lying to her. Not yet, anyway. I'm feeling mildly guilty for withholding information, but then again, this is part of the problem. People always advising me on what's best. If I told Sophie I'm driving 300 miles to go to a gig with a guy I've made contact with through a Lonely Hearts ad, she'd probably steal my car keys, throw them down a drain, and make me confess my rash behavior to her parents. 
I envisaged their looks of grave concern and their palpable disappointment at my lack of good judgment. I've played the scenario over in my head numerous times during these past two weeks and almost talked myself out of going, but stupidity prevails and here I am about to meet my fate. At least I don't have to worry about my parents receiving news their cherished and beloved daughter was killed in a sleazy Vegas motel, strangled and mutilated by a crazed sex beast. Mr. Hunter's taking a long weekend, and I interpret his absence as a good omen for the day ahead. I'm already missing the list of salacious suggestions he likes to run through while guessing what I'm doing for the weekend. I often interrupt his train of thought with tales of cleaning cat litter trays, of how useful cat litter is for repelling slugs, and how I'm considering a circle around my desk as a deterrent to keep slimy pests away. Sometimes my sarcasm works, sometimes it excites him. I've spent all morning clock watching. I can't concentrate. I don't want to leave too early. Even though Ken's absent, there are other eyes in the office paying keen attention to all that's going on. I respond to emails and check my calendar for the weeks ahead, confirming or dismissing appointment requests. I go to the kitchen and make fresh coffee. I go back to my desk. I go to the bathroom. I go back to my desk. I go to the vending machine. I go back to my desk. I check my emails. I check the clock. I don't want to be the first to leave. I check Google Maps. I check the weather forecast. I hear Tom from the strategic planning team wish everyone a good weekend. Ten minutes later, I sneak away, clutching several files I have no intention of opening. Two days of freedom and the opportunity for an adventure beckon. Stress melts away with L.A. in my rearview mirror. Strange new emotions wrestle their way to the surface. Fear takes a back seat. Today, I have new travel companions. Excitement and anticipation are squashed into the passenger seat beside me. The harsh desert landscape provides a welcome distraction. The vast open space feels like freedom. Huge mountains lend security. Rocks sculpted by wind and rain provide accents, and the dry washes offer alternative routes. Hostile, spiky plants cling to a precarious existence in the poor, gritty dirt. The landscape is bare. There's nowhere to hide, nothing lurking. It's open and honest. I usually have the radio on, but today I'm happy in my own space, enjoying the buzz. This is me taking control of my destiny. I open the window for a blast of hot desert air. I can't decide if it smells like bravery or stupidity, but it feels exhilarating. Anticipation for the intangible and unknown have me bursting with energy. After the high comes a sobering crash, a mental one. I'm suddenly overwhelmed by the realization I'm alone without a clue. I'm directionless, without a map, without a care, with only my poorly developed instincts to rely on. Can I depend on myself to make sensible and considered decisions? I have no one close to turn to if I make bad choices, no one to help me pick up the pieces. What's behind this flawed decision? I remind myself what's led me to drive 300 miles across the desert for a date with a head case at a gig in Vegas. It's an opportunity to assert myself, to step out of my comfort zone and meet someone new. I know it's a bad idea, but why does it feel so good? I conclude that years of criticism have rendered me inert. I'm physically frozen and mentally imploding. My life is like a waking dream where you're desperate to escape your pursuer but stricken with paralysis or your limbs are made of lead and won't follow the instructions coming from your brain to flee the scene. All the time, well-meaning friends and family point me in the right direction. Overstatement. More accurately, Mom, Pops, and Sophie. 
Then, the moment I'm let loose, I act crazy, take risks like a trip across the desert to meet a mystery man. Maniac? Maybe my life lacks excitement. No maybe about it. And maybe I'm desperate. I'm certainly guilty of crawling the walls. Maybe I'm about to meet the man of my dreams. Maybe I'm about to encounter a psychopathic pervert who's into raping and killing naive and unsuspecting young women. Maybe it's simply my fate. It's always maybe with me. So unless I take positive action, my life will always be one big fat question mark. I can still back out. I don't have to go through with this. Being alone in Vegas isn't a problem. It's easy blending in with a crowd. You can be anonymous, but sociable, feeding off the excitement and wonderment of others without even speaking. No one notices you're alone. For all they know, you might be innocently waiting for a friend or lover. So I can enjoy a wild, self-indulgent weekend in my own company, entertaining myself with shopping, gambling, or pampering myself at the hotel spa. I make plans in my head. Fashion show mall is a definite, and the factory outlets, of course. I'll check out who's playing at the House of Blues, or purchase a ticket for a Cirque du Soleil show at one of those half-price ticket booths. I've always fancied the Neon Museum, and Fremont Street's always interesting. There are plenty of distractions to fill my time. I really don't need to put myself through the trauma of meeting up with a strange stranger. I know the odds of winning in Vegas are low. I'm aware how you usually come away with less than what you arrived with, sometimes a lot less. I'll concentrate on winning, coming back with more, a lot more. I'll go shopping and fill my bags. As I come over the brow of the hill, there it is. Exciting, thrilling Las Vegas, baby, glistening in the valley like a cave of pirate treasure. In the distance, planes at McCarran Airport take off and land like a conveyor belt, bringing in the winners and whisking away the losers like the sweep of a croupier's hand. The traffic's heavy, and I'm pleased I've chosen to stay at a familiar hotel south of the city and far enough away from the Strip to avoid the congestion and Friday night madness. Room 7777. Lucky sevens for lucky me. I check the view. It's perfect. Overlooking the glistening pool with the bright neon lights of the Strip popping and flashing in the distance. The green laser beam from the apex of the Luxor Pyramid shoots vertically into space, pointing at infinite possibilities. I wander into the bathroom and examine the toiletries. I can't ignore the lure of the jacuzzi. It's begging for half a bottle of the enlivening grapefruit bath gel. I undress and unpack my bag. Before jumping in the tub, I'm drawn to the classifieds in the weekly advertisers. I check for evidence, searching for my mystery date to see if he's a regular predator on the lost and lonely circuit. There's no sign of him in the papers or the Vegas connections. Maybe he concentrates on one victim at a time, killing and disposing of the body before he lines up his next target. It doesn't matter anyway, because I'm not going. And I'm not giving the ticket away either, because I don't want to hand someone else an appointment with a serial killer. The last thing I need is being implicated in a violent homicide. A random association flashes through my mind and I'm reminded of an article I read earlier about a new band. The Killers come from Las Vegas. I step into the bath and turn on the jets, realizing moments later I've overdone it with the gel. Foam cascades over the side of the tub and creeps across the bath mat. I laugh at myself as I bat and blow the bubbles away from my face. After a long soak, I climb out and go through to the bedroom. I look out the view while I plaster myself in the rich, musky-smelling body lotion. The radio plays Steely Dan, and I sing along to Do It Again. It puts me in the mood for a gig, so I check who's playing at the House of Blues. I haven't heard of them, but their name, Ten Tons of Lead, suggests heavy metal, so I give it a miss. I lie back on the bed, meticulously studying the minibar menu, grappling with myself over the price of pink champagne. 
I love pink champagne, but it is pricey. Hey, I'm in Vegas, and I'm going to have fun, and if I drink enough of it, I won't care how much it costs. I also consume a whole box of dark chocolate raspberries, but their price is irrelevant. They transcend the value of money. I lift the glass to my lips, close my eyes, concentrate on the sensual bubbles bursting on my tongue, and wait for the first rush of excitement. By the time I empty my glass, I'm thinking about the man, haunted and alone, who's waiting for me. By the time I finish the second glass, I'm considering my outfit and rehearsing conversations in my head. All it takes is one small bottle of pink champagne and my resolve to stand up my date with Mr. Psycho has burst along with the bubbles. Anyone would think I'm easy. Oh, to hell with it. I'm in Vegas with a ticket for a band I might like, and nothing's going to happen to me when I'm surrounded by people. If the situation turns hairy, I'll approach security and ask for assistance. I suspect Mr. Haunted Man is either some teenage goth with an overactive imagination or some middle-aged guy with a beer belly reliving his youth. I can enjoy the gig, then make my excuses. I have to leave. The babysitter's expecting me. The youngest is only six months and needs feeding. Yes, that will do the trick. Extinguish any thoughts of romance and hasten a speedy exit. I don't want to give the wrong impression, so I dress accordingly in faded but comfortable jeans and a gray silk shirt. There's no call for vampire claret tonight. Minimal makeup and a quick squirt of Coco Chanel will do, and taking my car gives me control of the situation, providing me with an incentive not to drink anymore. On arrival at the venue, I opt for valet parking in case he follows me back to my car. Inside, I wander around finding my bearings. I study the seating plan and note my position, the far left quite close to the stage. I sit down in front of a slot machine and check out people arriving. The machine flashes, inviting me to find three crowned frogs and possibly my prince if I kiss the big fat red lips of the correct frog. I contemplate what I'll do once I'm inside the theater. I'll walk casually down the aisle, searching for my seat, taking a close look at who's in the seat adjacent to mine. If he looks okay, I might stay, but if he looks too weird, I'll keep on walking. It's foolproof because he doesn't know what I look like. I smile to myself, pleased with my smart thinking, my accountant's logic. A waitress approaches. Cocktails? Cocktails? A uh, Bellini, please. Brimming with peachy confidence, I approach the theater turnstile and present my ticket. The doorman rips off the stub and attaches a silver plastic wristband stamped with a date and a TLC hologram. He gives me a broad smile and winks. Enjoy the show, he says, which results in immediate paranoia. My imaginary glass of courage shatters on the floor. Is it him? Is he the one? As the seats begin to fill, I hang back, drinking lime and soda. I surreptitiously watch the crowd weaving around the bar, but avoid direct eye contact with anyone. I've no idea who or what I'm looking for, but my senses are on high alert. I have a clear view of my seat and can see the row is still empty, apart from a couple sitting towards the middle. My seat is CCO3, so it's highly likely he'll be sitting in CCO4. At least I can make an excuse about going to the bathroom and escape without stepping over him if I decide to bail out. Standing on tiptoes, I raise my chin and... Oh my God, there he is. I can't see his face, but I catch a glimpse as he sits. He looks okay from behind. Tall, medium build, spiky black hair and a denim shirt. In the bathroom, I regulate my breathing and perform last-minute checks. I falter down the aisle to the front of the auditorium and turn with ticket in hand, studying it closely, pretending I'm confused. With each step towards my seat, my eyes flit between him and the sparkling ticket. With each glance, I form an opinion. He pays me no attention and the lighting's giving me an opportunity to assess him from afar. First impressions, he's about 30, appears normal, 
average, relaxed, unexciting. So here goes. I hide behind others as I approach row CC. I hesitate at the end of the row and jump back when he raises his head to scan the entrance, searching for me. He's actually quite good looking. Maybe tonight won't be so bad after all. He doesn't look like a serial killer. Mind you, I did have a teenage crush on Jeffrey Dahmer for several months. I sidle into my seat and he turns to face me. Hi is all I can manage. Hi, do you need to get by? He asks. Uh, No, I think this is my seat. He smiles and I sit. He's cool and I wonder if he's shy, but his body language contradicts my theory. Maybe I'm not his type. My mind races down a list of obscure possibilities. Several minutes pass and the seats are filling up. I glance at my watch, ten minutes to go. I'm compelled to say something before the show starts. I struggle to recall the clever repartee I practiced earlier. Several lines enter my fuddled mind, but I'm doubtful I can deliver the words in the right order. Minutes pass. I'm about to speak when a woman about my age says, Excuse me. I sit back in my seat to let her pass. She stands in front of my date and says, Sorry, hun, did you miss me? I bumped into Natalie and she started telling me about her new job. Okay, babe, he says, I thought you were lost. I'm the one who's lost and he's definitely not my date. My heart's racing, panicked, but thankful I just avoided an extremely embarrassing encounter. Lucky his girl returned when she did, or I might have made a complete and utter fool of myself. So, mystery man must be sitting in CC02. My infallible plan of checking him out first is crumbling. I grab my bag, ready to make a swift exit when another couple takes the two vacant seats beside me. So my date is a no-show. It's almost a relief until it occurs to me Maybe he's sitting in another row or directly behind me, observing me from a distance. Creepy. Dimming lights distract me. A man appears on the stage and shouts, Hello, Las Vegas! The crowd shouts hello back. He asks, Can I please remind you to switch off all mobile devices? And also remind you that recording of any part of tonight's performance is strictly prohibited. With that said now... Let's show a little TLC as we welcome Torment Loves Company to Las Vegas. Shouting, clapping, and wolf whistles fill the auditorium as the band members walk on stage. The lead singer raises his guitar and presents it to the audience and perches on a high stool. He thanks us for coming as he plays a few chords, provoking more cheering from the fans who recognize the song. Seattle Street Song he announces as the crowd continues shouting and whistling. He sings, and his words seep into me, such a beautifully sad song. Waning moon, rising sorrow, this hurt will stay with me tomorrow. I know you're out there somewhere. Every night I'm traveling, going nowhere. His painfully captivating voice almost implies he hurts, smokes, drinks, and shouts too much. As the show continues, his often tragic lyrics cause chills, and I wish I'd paid them more attention in the past. It's safe to say my date is a no-show. My anxiety subsides as I become absorbed in the performance. The singer introduces himself as Caleb, and the other guitarist is Jake, who's hot and he knows it. He wears his black hair long and sweeps it back in dramatic fashion to reveal a sexy sneer. He moves with confident arrogance. He's incredibly charismatic and clearly adores the attention. Tight black jeans emphasize his long legs and a well-worn black leather jacket broadens his straight shoulders. I don't notice the lead singer much. My eyes close every time he opens his mouth and I fall deep under the spell of his hypnotic voice. It's heavy with tortured emotion and laced with genuine pain as he pours out his sorrowful stories. While I'm applauding, I study him and find it funny we share a similar hairstyle. The top section of his wavy golden hair 
is tied back to keep it from his eyes. He's unshaven, not exactly a beard. It's more unkempt looking, kind of like his wild hair. I can't see him too clearly because his focus is either on the centrally placed microphone or gazing over to his left when he looks up. I like his casual dress, faded jeans, scuffed square toe harness boots, and a 70s tan leather shirt. He portrays a man who's seen hard times, who's suffered pain and heartbreak along the way. His style adds to the illusion the songs wouldn't be so convincing coming from someone too clean cut. He's introducing Ryder, their incredibly fit drummer. Ryder beats his bare chest, provoking screams and whistles. He's wearing shorts and little else apart from a gallery of gruesome tattoos and a headband. I thought at first the headband looked stupid, but the spray of sweat flying off his drumsticks in the bright lights, casting sparkling arcs across the stage, proves he needs it. I almost forgot what brought me here, so I'm completely unprepared when the lead singer announces, This is a new song. A few plaintive chords escape. This is Haunted Man. It doesn't register at first, not until he turns his gaze in my direction. Rachel, I am the Haunted Man. I think I might faint or vomit or both. I'm frozen. Without moving my head, my eyes rapidly dart around to see if anyone noticed what's happened. I'm relieved there's no sign of any unwanted attention from the audience. They probably don't realize his comment was aimed at me. I concentrate on my breathing, taking deep breaths. All I remember of the song is the opening lines. She's lost her mind. She's lost her soul. She needs a haunted man to take control. I didn't see this coming in my rearview mirror. I'm completely blindsided. I can't begin to imagine what's going on. Panic and confusion overwhelm me. My legs are numb. My blood is diverted to save my vital organs. And I pray he won't invite me up on the stage. To the front and left of me, I'm aware of a security guy coming through the door marked backstage. He walks up the outside aisle and stands at the end of my row. As the song ends and applause starts, he excuses himself and leans across the couple next to me to pass me a note. I hold the piece of paper, not daring to look. The finale comes. They perform their last song, Jack of Clubs. The crowd shouts twist and punch the air as they sing along. I am the jack of clubs, smoking, drinking in the pubs. The girls are young and pretty, every night party city. Twist. When the song ends and the lights come on, I steal a look at what I'm clutching in my shaking hand. A folded flyer advertising tonight's show with a plain message of simple instructions scrawled across it in large, thick, black letters. Please wait for me. Caleb. XXX. That was a chapter from Cheryl Cocroft's contemporary fiction novel, Spokane Words, read by Lori Fagan. You can find out more about Cheryl and her books on her Amazon author page at amazon.com slash author slash Cheryl Cocroft. And she's on Facebook as Cheryl Cocroft and on Instagram at Spokane Tales, and that is T-A-L-E-S. The details are also in the show notes. Join us again on episode number eight when you'll hear the final episodes from Frightful Funhouse, the audiobook podcast section of my crime fiction novel, Fade Out. And in episode nine, I'll read my mystery short story called Three Strikes. If you are listening on the podcast platform of your choice, please subscribe and leave a review or provide us with some feedback. If you're on YouTube at Read Lori Fagan, please subscribe, give us a thumbs up, and click on the bell to be notified when a new episode has been released. And for more freebies, check out our Patreon page at Murder in the Air Mystery Theater. 
Remember I mentioned prizes? At the end of each of these Murder in the Air podcasts, we'll have a drawing for a prize from those who follow Read Lori Fagan on Facebook or Instagram. And in the comment, write murder to be entered in a drawing. We'll have drawings for free ebooks, chances to win your name in a novel, and other fun items. So go to Facebook or Instagram, follow Read Lori Fagan, and write murder in the comment. For more information, you can visit readlaurifagan.com. Thanks so much for listening, and come back again for more Murder in the Air. <laughs>